Good afternoon. Um, yes, it's, my name is Laura Parkinen and I steer the neuropathology arm of the OPDC. I'm based in Oxford Brain Bank, which is situated in the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences in John Radcliffe Hospital. And if anybody would like to get in touch with me, I'm very um, happy to receive your emails. Um, I'm delighted to tell you about this new diagnostic test that we have uh, developed. It's uh, used as a, a biomarker, and you might ask why do we need biomarkers? As isn't the first goal would be obviously to find a cure, find a uh, treatment for Parkinson's disease. However, the brain cells start to die most likely 10 to 20 years already before the symptoms appear. So we have to find some sort of way to identify those um, people at risk so that we can start uh, treating them early enough. At the moment, there's actually no definite test for Parkinson's disease, and the diagnosis is entirely based on the clinical symptoms. And as I said, that the time when the, the diagnosis is normally made, about 70 to 80 percent of your nigral neurons are already gone. So it might be too late for any um, therapy to really have a full impact in that stage. As Michelle um, mentioned, um, what happens in the Parkinson's disease brain is that a protein called alpha-synuclein for some reason becomes sticky. It's a normal protein in everybody's brain. We, it's quite abundantly present, but at the moment we don't really know what it is, is its normal function. However, it starts to aggregate and form these kind of like um, fibrils. First, kind of oligomers, which are kind of like the pre-stage of, of a real fibril, and then protofibrils, and in the end, amyloid fibrils, which form these kind of uh, sticky clumps inside the brain cells, both in neurons and in the glial cells. And what is problematic is that you see over here the normal protein, which is then starts to aggregate and, and it gets misfolded and becomes a sick protein. But what is very important is that this sick protein seems to have some sort of um, um, ways that it can actually recruit more normal protein to become sick. So it's templating uh, the disease process throughout the brain. And this actually propagates um, in the brain um, from in a certain way um, and progresses throughout. And this is what people call a prion-like propagation, um, uh, which is a phenomena where, where many, many current therapies are, are now kind of based on. So where can we find this alpha-synuclein protein? It's actually not only found in the brain, it's secreted from those uh, dying neuronal cells also to the cerebrospinal fluid, which is a clear colorless um, body fluid which is found outside of the uh, brain and the spinal cord. Alpha-synuclein is also found in many other peripheral biosamples such as olfactory epithelium, gut, and saliva. And these could be more accessible for us to sample. Now, the assay that I'm here to tell you about is called real-time quicking-induced conversion, RT-quick for short. That's quite a mouthful, and I'm gonna to try to explain to you what does it actually mean. So we are using CSF uh, as our medium where we are um, um, measuring this, this test. We, we, take, um, we make a lumbar puncture for the patients to get the CSF, and we use a very small amount, just 10 microliters of this, um, um, this um, liquid, and use this kind of 96 swell plate, which has wells where we mix this um, sick, this, the patient's CSF with the normal protein. And then we just start to shake. And we shake in this kind of machine for 120 hours. And whilst we are shaking, this 
these um, fibrils that form, they form bonds, which are beta sheet forms, uh, beta sheeted, uh, pleated uh, um, peptide bonds, and we can detect these with thioflavin um, dye, which is a certain dye that uh, elicits a fluorescent um, light. And with these curves, we kind of see this aggregation process, which is exactly the same process that occurs also in a human brain. Now, this assay of us was published um, 2015, and we, we carried out the development of it in three different phases. Most importantly, the development was actually carried out by using brain tissue. So we, we measured different kind of um, substrate concentrations and buffers and speed of agitation for this, this shaking procedure, temperature, all sorts of added accelerators that you could put into the test, and most importantly also how much of the CSF we actually needed to carry out this test. These are all very vital um, parameters that actually then allowed us to create a test that we first explored in vivo, in, in the CSF which has taken in vivo from patients that had actually donated their brains to the brain bank later on. So we were absolutely sure that they did have this kind of alpha synuclein pathology in their brain. And what you can see over here is that we saw this kind of like aggregation procedure happening, this, this um, signal of the test only happening in those patients that did actually have the alpha synuclein pathology in the brain. And this gave uh, sensitivity for Parkinson's disease to be 100% and in a related disorder which um, has Parkinsonism and dementia, called dementia with Lewy bodies, to be 92%. And we did not detect this signal in any of the controls. Then we were ready to move into a validation phase, which meant that we looked at CSF samples which were taken from our own OPDC cohort. And at the moment, we've done all the CSF samples that we have um, um, valuably being donated uh, from our cohort, and um, 76 samples at the total come from Parkinson's patients, and in those we can see that this, this test detects the Parkinson's disease in 88% sensitivity. Again, it's very important that we don't need, did not see the signal in any of our controls. What is interesting is that we did see this positive signal also in some patients that suffer from the REM sleep dis behavior disorder, which we will hear more about later on uh, during the afternoon. And these patients are very valuable because they are in a high risk of having Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. Some studies have suggested that 80% of these uh, RBD patients will develop some sort of alpha synuclein pathology. If you would like to have more information on this test, please go and, and check out this BBC website and, and also Sky News at the time. This, this did um, um, raise quite a lot of uh, public attention as well. What we have now in head of us is actually quite a lot of work. We're still not ready in that sense to just to say that we have a sensitive and specific test. Yes, this is exciting because, first of all, it might allow us to do the differential diagnosis and it might allow us to do it very early if it is true that these RBD patients do really um, get positive and we can start following them and see when they convert to actual Parkinson's disease. However, what is also important with the diagnostic biomarker that you would have some sort of quantitative readout. If you saw those signals, they kind of go up. And we have, and the, and the controls stay, stay down. So we have this kind of yes or no answer, but that's not gonna be enough. We need to have some sort of quantitative readout, which we can follow all throughout the disease to monitor its progression. And also we can then use this kind of quantitative readout to assess whether those therapies that Michelle was mentioning earlier on do actually have effect especially the ones that are aimed at lowering the alpha synuclein burden in the brain. 
So what we have done with these curves that we see, these signal curves, is that we have looked at all sorts of um, parameters that we can um, extract from them. So we have this kind of lag phase over here. It's while the alpha synuclein is starting to aggregate, it's still those kind of oligomers. It hasn't really started off going to become uh, mature fibrils. Then we have this maximum slope called Vmax, which means just that how quickly the synuclein aggregation actually occurs, how prone it is to become sticky. And then we have the time to reach 50% maximum of the final aggregation and, and other um, little bit more complicated parameters. But we have examined and extracted all of these from our PDC cohort, where we also have very careful clinical tests. So we've been able to correlate these kinetic parameters with, for example, with the motor score called UPDRS. And it seems to be, according to our preliminary analysis, that this Vmax, which meant this slope, so how, um, how um, sticky the protein actually is, that correlates with more severe symptoms. And also the same thing with the cognitive impairment. The stickier the alpha synuclein is in the CSF, the more um, severe cognitive impairment there seems to be. So just to wrap this up is that we have now developed a novel biomarker um, assay called RT-QUICK which measures the stickiness of the alpha synuclein and gives us very high sensitivity and specificity for the PD and the related disorder called dementia with Lewy bodies. The positive test responses were also found in some patients that do have a risk of, some people say almost 80% risk of developing one of these alpha synucleopathies, either Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. And we find a, more, a positive correlation between the disease severity in both motor symptoms and in the cognitive symptoms and uh, some of the kinetic parameters, those quantifiable readouts of our signal as well. So this suggests that it might have a potential to monitor disease progression and most importantly to see um, how well the therapies are actually working in the patients. But there's a lot to be done now. Uh, first of all, we need to perform this RT quick test in a much larger cohort of these at-risk patients. At the moment, we had only looked at CSF from six RBD patients that, that, that we have in our discovery cohort. I have now done quite a lot of work together with Michelle to identify these, these patients, which are still relatively rare throughout the world, and, and especially those cohorts where these patients have given kindly donated their CSF. And we have um, collected them all throughout from America, from Germany, um, um, Spain, and, and we are trying to now start to look at those to see whether we can estimate the time window. When can we see the signal and when do they convert to, to um, to having Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, just that we can see how early we can detect it. Is it really an early diagnostic biomarker? And then next, what is most important and quite a, um, a problem at the moment in, in, in the field is that all these biomarkers that we can measure either from CSF or blood. We don't really know at all how is it that they relate to the progression of the alpha synuclein pathology in the brain. So in Oxford, we are in in an incredibly um, good position in that sense that we have these cohorts. We have a cohort called Optima, uh, which is a longitudinal study of aging that started already in 1970s. And these people that have been in this aging cohort have given their CSF throughout the, 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 the study and then donated their brain in the end. So we can then now look at these CSF samples from that cohort and also see how does it actually truly correlate to the progression of this pathology in the brain. Um, and then one difficulty at, 
is, is not only the early diagnosis, but is also the early correct diagnosis. Parkinson's disease um, can be mistaken, even by a very competent uh, movement disorder specialist, to be something else, uh, to be some other atypical Parkinsonism, which is not caused by alpha synuclein aggregation, it's caused by aggregation of other proteins. And it's very important that we can distinguish those from PD, um, because the treatment is, is different. So we're going to be look at a large European MSA cohort. Again, these samples are from a French uh, cohort and, and compare those to our PD and DLB samples to be able to see whether we can stratify between these different um, uh, Parkinsonisms. And finally, um, we are using CSF at the moment to carry out this, this diagnostic test. So we are trying to already now to um, modify our assay to be um, applicable to more accessible, um, accessible bio samples, such as olfactory mucosa or gut or saliva, all of these media which do have alpha synuclein as well. So here, this is one of the um, arms that we are um, uh, researching further is that we're trying to apply the RT quick on olfactory mucosa. This is a very attractive approach because people think that, um, or the pathologists think that the alpha synuclein pathology actually starts from the olfactory bulb and then moves along in certain pathways in the brain. So it would be the earliest site where you could actually detect it, and thus it could give us, a, it could be an early diagnostic biomarker as well. So here you can see myself having this test done. I can say that it's, it's um, well, I have never had a lumbar puncture done for myself, so I can't compare it, but I, I wouldn't say it was, it wasn't, Comfortable, comfortable as such, that you do put the, the, this fiber optic rhinoscope into your nose to get the actual mucosal sample. But it's a very short procedure. It takes only about two minutes. Uh, and then you collect the sample with the sterile brush. And over here, we have already shown that we can actually get those olfactory neurons, um, which you can see over here in that picture marked with the arrows. Um, so our sample does contain them, and they do also possess certain neuronal markers, though that we are certain that, that our testing um, um, is, is uh, correct. So this, this may have actually quite, quite um, high potential to make this our, our test now more accessible. And I would like to finish by, first of all, acknowledging all the donors and their families without the biosamples that we work and then also, most importantly, the people who have donated their brain to our brain bank. This kind of studies would not be possible. And I have to emphasize that this test really was first done by using the brain tissue. Um, and I'm sure uh, George, who's going to give a talk later on, will, uh, will uh, tell you even further why is it that it is so important to, to contribute to these kind of studies. And I have had many people working on, on um, the development of this assay, mostly Ilaria, where you can, who you can see on the uh, left top panel, Ilaria Poggiolini, who already had quite um, extensive um, background on carrying out these kind of uh, tests, and she's been absolutely crucial for this development work. Thank you.